I hope I'm not going to disappoint. Did I hear magical powers? <laughs> Jeez. Um, well, first of all, it is, uh, it is really an honor to be here. Um, I was mentioning to some folks earlier today that I, I think I was here something like two or three days before uh, this, uh, the library opened. And I remember seeing construction cranes everywhere, and I was thinking, man, oh man, they've still got a lot of work to do before this thing opens up. But clearly, uh, it all got done. And, um, you know, both as uh, part of Make-A-Wish and with Habitat for Humanity, uh, we've had the privilege of working uh, very closely with President Clinton. Um, and he's just been a terrific supporter of both organizations. And so, you know, it's really, a, uh, it's really an honor to be here. What I'd like to do today is, um, uh, is, is really do four things. Uh, one is that I'd like to show you a short video. You know, the, uh, the old term, a picture's worth a thousand words. Well, I don't know how many words a video is, but, uh, but I think it's a little bit more than that. But just to give you a sense of, uh, of, of what we do uh, with Make-A-Wish. Uh, secondly, because so many of you are in the, uh, uh, you're studying to be in the field of, of public service, some of you will, will have careers in government, but some of you also have careers in the nonprofit sector. Uh, I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about the uh, kind of the business side of, uh, of Make-A-Wish just a little bit. And third, I'd like to tell you a little bit about my own personal journey and um, uh, how I got into this. Um, and then finally, uh, just a couple, um, a couple leadership uh, uh, tips as you uh, progress in your career. So that's the, uh, the game plan, and we're gonna talk fast because we, uh, we got an hour. So uh, I wanna show you a clip. Uh, about five years ago, we started a partnership with ESPN. So hey, you didn't know you get to come here and watch, uh, and watch ESPN, but they do a uh, short vignettes on, uh, on wishes that involve celebrities. And so last year we granted a little shy, a little less than 14,000 wishes. About 1,000 of them involve uh, meeting celebrities. And so this is one that, um, that took place a few years ago. And uh... good way to end. Welcome back to Sports Center. I'm Chris Connolly. And in conjunction with the Make-A-Wish Foundation and with the support of Disney, over the next two weeks, Sports Center will be presenting a series entitled My Wish, in which we'll be making sports wishes come true for 10 courageous children with life-threatening illnesses. Now, our first wish takes place in an NFL minicamp. It's a no-nonsense time to get players ready for the upcoming season. But that didn't stop the Philadelphia Eagles from opening their doors and their hearts to one unforgettable young fan. Living with his family in a five-story walk-up on Manhattan's west side, 12-year-old Charlie Pena seems every bit the typical New York kid. Except Charlie doesn't root for the Jets or the Giants. He's a die-hard Eagles fan. When they win, I'm jumping all over the place. When they lose, I'm mad. Charlie's siblings have seen that rabid enthusiasm for themselves. How can you tell he's a neat fan of the Philadelphia Eagles, Kyle? Because he has a hat and a shirt already. And he's always saying he loves the Eagles, Eagles, Eagles. If you could say anything to Donovan McNabb, what would you say to him? Donovan, you're the best. You inspire me sometimes. And just keep on doing what you're doing and help the Eagles win their first Super Bowl. Yet even as he glows with energy and enthusiasm for his Eagles, Go Eagles! Charlie Pena suffers from sickle cell anemia, a life-threatening blood disorder so debilitating, he's needed four hospital stays in the last year alone, with random attacks of brutal pain in his legs, his chest, and his back. Um, so our mission is that we grant the wishes of kids with life-threatening medical conditions to enrich the human experience with hope, strength, and joy. Now, this is actually a little bit different from, uh, than what it was. And one of the biggest misconceptions about Make-A-Wish is that we grant the wishes of kids who, what? Have a terminal illness. That this is the, the, their, kind of their last wish, their dying wish. And, um, and that's something that uh, is, there's a misconception about that because 
uh, that is how the organization first got started. Uh, back in 1980, there was a, a young boy by the name of Chris Gracious who had leukemia. And uh, back in 1980, if you had leukemia, there was a 90% chance that you would not survive your illness. Thanks to uh, all the advances in medicine, today, if you have leukemia, there's a 90% chance that you will survive your illness. Uh, but Chris had a, uh, had a favorite show. And his show, now this, only the older folks here might remember this one. Does anybody here remember the show Chips? <laughs> all right, there we go. So for the younger ones here, uh, it was a show about uh, two California motorcycle uh, policemen. And so he, um, he watched that show all the time. And he loved it. And he always told everyone that when he grew up, that's what he was going to be. He was going to be a motorcycle policeman just like that. And so when he, he got leukemia and it wasn't looking good, uh, his mom went to some friends and said, you know, could, do you think we could have him be a policeman for the day? And sure enough, the Arizona uh, state troopers went out and uh, a group of volunteers, uh, volunteers sewed a uniform. Uh, he got to ride in a helicopter on a motorcycle in a car. Um, he became, he's still the only honorary Arizona State Trooper in its, in its history. And uh, when, he got, when he was done, he went home, he wrote tickets in his neighborhood, and he just, <laughs> and it was just a great experience. And afterwards, fortunately, this small group of volunteers said, you know, this was such a great experience, uh, not just for him, but for his mom, uh, and, and for everybody that got involved, that we shouldn't just stop with Chris, we should, we should do this for other kids. And that's what they did. And so they, um, they started this organization. And uh, now, you know, 30 some odd years later, uh, over 275,000 wishes have been granted worldwide. And uh, a wish is being granted every, uh, every 38 minutes. And so, so our mission is to help kids. And in fact, now, instead of uh, kids with uh, terminal illness, now, in fact, nationally, about 75% of the kids who are eligible for a wish actually survive their illness. And in fact, it's now become part of a lot of treatment protocol where doctors are, are seeing how impactful these wishes can be in the recovery of, this, uh, uh, of these kids. And so, you know, you, you don't, first of all, it's, it's more than just the child. Uh, when a child has a life-threatening medical condition, it impacts the entire family. And so here you have families that all of a sudden their world just turns upside down. You know, everybody's, you worry about class, you school, sports, all the problems that, you know, that we all have. And then all of a sudden the diagnosis comes along like this and everybody's world turns upside down. Now you're not worried about school. Your, your wish actually is one thing, right? For this kid to be able to survive their illness. And so it impacts brothers and sisters and moms and dads. And what we hear time and time again is that this experience is something that can, can help them get through that. And so for some of these kids, it's uh, you know, a chance to focus on something other than radiation, chemotherapy, doctor's visits, surgeries, all those kind of things that just become uh, the staple of, of every single day. And so, um, so it's much more than just a, uh, a nice thing. Uh, more and more uh, of the medical community and others are seeing it as a, as a necessary thing. So our vision is actually that every child who's eligible would be able to receive a wish. And, uh, and so while we're very proud of the 14,000 kids that we, uh, that we serve, actually there are 27,000 kids that are diagnosed with a life-threatening medical condition every year. And so for every family we're helping, there's a family that we're not. And that's what uh, that's what drives us as an organization to be able to figure out what are the things that we can do to essentially double our size. If you look at the size of the organization in the United States, we're about a $240 million organization. So that means, you know, we've, we've got some work to do. And that's why, that's why we do what we do. Our values, you know, if we only had one, it would be, uh, it would be integrity. I mean, that's, if you don't have that in the nonprofit sector, you're in trouble. There are 1.4 million uh, nonprofit organizations in the United States. Giving is not mandatory. Giving is discretionary. And if you are an organization that does not have integrity, a, a donor has 1.4 million other options out there. And so it's absolutely critical in, in any organization. Child Focus really says that if we're going to err, we're going to err on the side of the child. And a lot of times, um, 
you know, there are situations that come up that, uh, you know, it, that we need to be able to take a step back and say, you know, what, what is absolutely the very best thing f uh, for our child. Of course, we want to do things with excellence. Um, you know, a lot of times you don't realize the sense of community that can be created. Uh, the, uh, the example that was given, uh, I heard about this morning at breakfast uh, when I met with the uh, community leaders here in Little Rock. And what was really cool about the telling of that story was how many people were involved in it. It wasn't just the child, it wasn't just the family, it was all these volunteers, it was a movie theater full of, uh, of kids, uh, of individuals that got to participate in that wish. And so we're really about community and then we are in the inspiration business. We not only want to be able to uh, help inspire kids, but the reality is, is that those kids inspire us by their courage and, uh, and by their hopes and dreams. We, uh, we typically have uh, four different types of wish, and so the first is, you know, they want to meet somebody. Uh, wish to meet a, uh, a celebrity, and it could be sports, it could be uh, a whole, uh, whole number of things. Uh, I wish to be something, so I wish to be Batman, or a superhero, or a policeman. Uh, wish to have something, or uh, wish to go someplace. As you might imagine, uh, amazingly, uh, President Clinton is still receiving uh, wishes to meet him. And, um, and so I would imagine that picture was, might have been taken about 100 yards away from here. I don't know. But, um, but anyway, the, the thing that was great, we actually have a big picture of, uh, of one of the wishes that the President granted when he was in office. Um, and, uh, and so he was uh, terrific. Uh, I think the President is always uh, known for um, you know, not always being on schedule and maybe meetings lasting a little bit longer. Well, let me tell you, if you're a wish kid and your wish was to meet the president, uh, there's nothing better than that. And so we just heard so many stories about how great uh, the president was with, uh, with our wish kids. Uh, we do have a global reach. And so we're not just in the United States. We're actually in 47 countries uh, around the world. And so it's something that is, uh, is pretty exciting to see in other places besides uh, the United States. Uh, I had a question earlier today when I was having lunch with some of the students, you know, who supports us? Well, it's certainly individuals, uh, but you can see, and this is just a sampling of some of the, uh, of some of the organizations that, uh, that support Make-A-Wish. A lot of it is around something like cause-related marketing where, you know, you go to Macy's right now, if you, uh, no, we're not gonna talk about Macy's uh, because we don't have them here. I forgot about that, but. Uh, Subaru, you do, we, there are Subaru dealerships. And so you know what, in the month of December, if you buy or lease a Subaru, you have an opportunity to uh, have a $250 donation uh, directed to one of uh, five charities, and this is the charity you would want it to go to, right? <laughs> uh, you know, a lot of the airlines, uh, and, and really this is an individual donation, but they allow people to be able to donate their miles. And so that's uh, an interesting, way to be able to support the organization. 70% of all of our wishes involve some kind of travel. Our need for miles are about 2 billion miles a year, and so it's, a, uh, it's an easy way to do that. You know, a company like Maggiano's, um, for, if you're familiar with them, but it's an Italian restaurant, you know, they have something called Eat a Dish for Make-A-Wish, and so they're very strategic about how they do these things where they will pick menu items that they want you to eat, and they'll say, you know, uh, especially something like dessert. So has anybody be ever been to a Maggiano's? You know, big family style, lots of food. You know, who orders dessert after all that stuff? Nobody does, but they know that. And so they come along and say, you know, if you order the strawberry cheesecake, $2 goes to Make-A-Wish. So you sit there and say, all right, you know, let's go ahead and do that. So, you know, everybody wins. They get to, they get to sell more desserts, which they weren't going to be able to sell. I guess the only one that doesn't win is is us, because we put on an extra whatever. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, it generates close to a million dollars a year. And so that's a, uh, so that's a really good thing. Um, we, uh, you know, the power of the brand is something that, uh, certainly in the nonprofit sector, is really important. If you take a look at the, those corporations, you know, there's a big reason why they want to work with an organization like Make-A-Wish, and that is because uh, we have a very powerful brand, a very positive brand. Somebody hears about the organization, they say, ah, Make-A-Wish, what a, what a great organization. And that's important. It, more and more corporations now are, are saying, well, first of all, they're saying, you know, we're not going to support 100 different organizations. We're going to support one. 
or we're going to support two. And th th they're making that decision, number one. But then the second decision that they're making is, all right, if we're going to support one, what can we do? Who should we partner with that is going to help us accomplish some of our business goals? Now, those goals might be selling more product. It might be getting more people to come to their website. It might be to uh, engage their employees. Uh, you know, employee, more and more employees want to work for organizations that are, that are making a difference. So there are all kinds of reasons. But the point is, is that businesses are not just saying, oh, yeah, let's just, let's just give money to a charity. You guys just go ahead and pick one. They're being much more strategic about it. Because they, if you do it right, then, um, then their brand is enhanced. And so it's a big deal. So you can see some of the things that, we're, uh, uh, that we think are important. And then two statistics I think that are interesting. So one is 90% of American consumers want companies to tell them ways they are supporting causes. And so in the United States, this is an expectation that we have. I mean, we want to buy a good product. We want to buy a good product at a good price. But we also want to have some kind of sense that the companies that we're supporting are good companies that they do good things, uh, that they good things, uh, good things in the world. And the second I think is interesting, is, and that's to my earlier point, is that you know, it's no longer enough just to say, oh yeah, well they, they give money. I mean, they wanna see that, they've, that, this, that this is real, that this is not just a, uh, it's easy to write a check, but that this is part of the fabric and part of the values of that company. We wanna be able to, uh, to, uh, to interact with companies like that. So what, um, what I'd like to do, and I want to make sure we leave uh, plenty of time for questions, but there are two things I'd like to do uh, going forward. So one is just very quickly uh, tell you a little bit about my journey in terms of how I got here, and then, uh, and then the two leadership things. So uh, there was not a Clinton School of Public Service when I was going to school. Uh, I went to become an accountant, and uh, the only reason I was in accounting, some of you may remember the movie uh, The Graduate, and I was like, I've got one word for you. What was the word? Plastics. There we go. All right. Well, when I was graduating from high school, the one word was accounting. I don't know why. But it's like, you know, there's always going to be accountants. So I went to become an accountant. I went to work for the Shell Oil Company. And uh, one good thing happened about working for the Shell Oil Company. I met my wife there. She just happened to be my supervisor. And, uh, and I was just trying to get a good performance review. But we came... We came to the conclusion, we both came to this conclusion, that I was not a very good accountant. And, um, and so, not wishing to get fired, uh, I, uh, I began, actually, what had happened is that in school, I had, uh, I had become much more serious about my faith. And as I looked at the scriptures and saw about what uh, God really said about care for those uh, less fortunate, I that was something that, I, uh, that, that really convicted me. And so I began volunteering with a lot of different nonprofit organizations. And while in Houston, I uh, volunteered with an organization that was just getting started called the Houston Food Bank. And it was, um, food banks were getting started around the United States. And they had just come to Houston. And they had had a tough time. They uh, got shut down by the city of Houston Health Department. They got kicked out of the National Food Bank Association. And they had had three directors in a year. And so, uh, and they were looking for a fourth. And so as a young accountant who didn't know anything, uh, but I could walk and chew gum and I was interested in the organization, they said, you know, come be our director. And it, and it turned out uh, really well. And so for me, while it was, you know, a cut in salary and it was an organization that had a lot of different issues, to me it was the easiest decision um, I could have made. It was, to me, it was an answer to prayer, and it was what I felt uh, I, I was, uh, what I was called to do. And so I did that for 11 years, then went to work with Habitat for Humanity, another organization, great organization, but another position in which I was completely, utterly unqualified for. Instead of running a local food bank, it was now an organization that operated in 48 countries around the world. Um, I think I'd been to Mexico, but I, that was, you know, that was about it. But being a chief operating officer for an international organization uh, was a, a huge, uh, was a huge step. But, uh, but had the privilege of, uh, of being there for 11 years and, uh, and, and seeing the work of Habitat in so many different countries. And, um, and, and so that was, uh, that was a privilege actually working uh, directly with the founder of Habitat for Humanity, who 
who actually was very good friends uh, with the president. And so, uh, so I had an opportunity to do that for 11 years and then finally uh, to come work with Make-A-Wish, who I told the students earlier today, is really the only position that I feel like I've been qualified for. And it's been, um, and so that's been, that's been kind of nice to be in a position where you feel like, all right, this, this, this one actually makes sense and we should be able to take this, uh, take this going forward. And so, so in a way, you know, I feel very fortunate that I was able to um, be able to, to really work for three, what I consider to be uh, great organizations. So what I'd like to do is, is just kind of end with two, uh, two leadership, what I, what I think are, are uh, important leadership um, uh, tidbits for you to uh, consider going forward. So the first one is uh, a, kind of a question. That, there are really two questions uh, to our young people. And so the first one is, um, what will you do when you fail? And, you know, we have an interesting uh, concept about failure in this world, and that failure is, is a bad thing. And yet, I would tell you that there are some lessons in life that can only be learned through failure. Um, I had the opportunity to speak one time at, a, um, at the Air Force Academy, where they had all 4,500 cadets. And I spoke opposite a guy named Gene Krantz. And Gene Krantz was the, uh, the NASA flight director for Apollo 13. And he was the one that uttered the famous line, uh, failure is not an option. And, you know, failure, and, and, and actually failure, or the fear of failure, can be a very powerful incentive. Because nobody really wants to fail, right? And a lot of times, that's what keeps us going. We, we don't want to fail that. Um, that's why we stay up until, you know, two in the morning to get that paper written. It's why, you know, we do what we do in our jobs to be able to, to get it done because we don't want to fail. But unfortunately, for a lot of us, the fear of failure or failure can be paralyzing as well. It can, it can uh, prevent us from doing something that we really think is important or that we want to do, and it's because we have this, uh, we have this fear of failure. And so, you know, when I was uh, telling you the story earlier about going to work with Habitat for Humanity, um, you know, if you kind of looked at it on paper, I mean, I was absolutely not qualified for either that position or Habitat for Humanity, but certainly with the Houston Food Bank. I mean, I'd never managed anybody before. Um, I'd never reported to a board of directors. I didn't know anything about the food industry. I didn't know anything about hunger in Houston. Um, I didn't know anything about working with volunteers, about warehousing, about distribution. I mean, I could, I could come up with a two-page list of what I didn't know about taking on that position. But I remember at the time thinking, all right, so what's the worst thing that can happen? Well, I could fail, right? And I'd get fired. Okay, well, they've already gone through three people. So from an organizational standpoint, I'm not going to feel that bad for them. But from my own personal standpoint, it was, okay, well, I could fail, and then what? Well, I could go back to being an accountant, all right? And so I just think that, you know, failure is one of those things where, again, culturally, we don't, um, I don't think we value the lessons of failure. And, and sometimes we, and so if you can use failure or the fear of failure to help you, to help propel you, then that's great. That's exactly, that's exactly what you should do. But I would just, as you're starting in your careers, um, you are going to fail. You know, if you look at America, good grief. You know, 70% of all businesses fail. What is it, 90% of all restaurants fail. Uh, even, you know, unfortunately, 50% of all marriages fail. I mean, failure is, is just simply a part of life. And so it's not, it's not whether you fail, it's what you're going to do after you fail. Um, one of the things, I, I played sports in college, and, um, and so I've always have, have this fondness for, uh, you know, if somebody's uh, uh, recruiting, if we're recruiting somebody and they played sports, and, you know, I just love talking sports and what sport they played and how successful they were and all that kind of stuff, and it's neat. But it's not about, it's not because, I, and I like the idea of having people who have competed uh, working in your organization. And to me, it doesn't have anything to do with this uh, will to win or, uh, uh, you know, that, that you've got what it takes to win. It's that if you have competed at any level, you have experienced failure. You just have. The greatest athletes that have ever walked on this earth have failed 
more times in their sports than most of us have even attempted to play in those sports. And, but what makes the great ones great is that after they do fail, they don't wallow in it, they, don't, they, they pick themselves back up, they kind of dust themselves off, and they get at it again. And I'm telling you, no matter what your career is, whether it's in government, nonprofit organization, for-profit organization, you're gonna experience failure. You just will. And, but the key thing is not that you're gonna experience it, it's what you're gonna do after. Are you gonna learn from it? Are you gonna be stronger as a result? And so that's, that's the first one. The second one, and the last one, is when I interviewed with uh, Habitat for Humanity, uh, I mentioned I worked for the founder. And he was, he was from the South. Uh, he was from Alabama, and, he, uh, and we sat down, and he said, I've got three questions for you. And so the first was, why do you want to work for Habitat? Uh, the second one was, what do you know about direct mail? He made a lot of money in direct mail, and so that's another story. But the third one was, uh, he said, what melts your butter? He said, David, we have this phrase down here in the South, and it's, uh, it's what melts your butter. And, you know, I guess I was, uh, I was looking at a... Uh, uh, I, I, got, I got deer in the headlights look because I wasn't exactly sure what he meant. But it was, you know, what do you feel passionate about? What gets you up in the morning? What excites you? Uh, what melts your butter? And that would be what I would say to all of you. Now, to some extent, you know, I, I speak to a lot of different student groups, and I would say that this one's very different because I don't think most people go into the work of public service because you've been told you are gonna make millions of dollars at this thing. <laughs> so I think to some extent you've kind of answered uh, this question, that you've chosen to be here because you wanna be here, because you wanna be able to make a difference, because there's an issue or a challenge that's out there that, um, that touches you, that's broken your heart, that you feel a special calling for. And I would say to you that that's, that's great. That's, that's what makes life worth living, is to be able to, to be involved in an effort that you feel passionately about, that you feel you've been put on this earth to be able to do something about. And, you know, an awful lot of people have not had the opportunity to do that. Um, I think about my, uh, one of my grandfathers. He was a coal miner. I'm sure if I asked him, you know, is, uh, if you had a choice of anything that you could do, I don't think that was it, because he started when he was in fourth grade. He ultimately lost a, a leg in the mines. He died of black lung, and, but boy, he did it because he was able to raise a family and provide a good, a good home. Um, but how privileged are we that we have an opportunity? We have choices. I had, I had choices my parents and my grandparents didn't have, and you have even more choices. And now you have institutions like this one that'll help you uh, be successful in that area. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in Houston and I was that bad accountant with the Shell Oil Company, I, uh, I remember riding to work one day and uh, Gallup had just come out with a new poll. And the poll was that 70% of all Americans, if given the choice, would do something else in their vocation. You know, I'm kind of driving along and I'm thinking, man, that is, that is really sad. That's just... <laughs> That's just terrible. God, that's awful, 70%. And then, you know, I'm a little slow. And so, you know, about five seconds later, I was like, oh, wait a second. I'm part of that 70% because if I had a choice, I was not gonna be accounting for gas wells up in Montana. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with being an accountant. My son is an accountant. It's, a, it's an honorable profession. My point is not about accounting. My point is that's not where my passion was. That's not what I felt I was, uh, I was here to do. And as a result, I wasn't very good at it. And so, so to all the students that are here, I mean, it's, this is preaching to the choir. I think you're already doing that. But as you think about you know, the organizations that, uh, that you'll possibly be working for, um, you know, don't, um, I mean, go with where your heart is on that. Uh, there are a lot of great organizations. You have more choices than any other generation ever has and uh, you already want to make a difference just by the virtue of the fact that you're here. And so, um, so I think we uh, wanted to leave a little bit of time for questions, and um, so here we go. Yes, sir. Oh, okay.
Um, I, I read a couple weeks ago about John Cena being granted his 300th visit. Why is it about the WWE and professional wrestling that draws um, kids to use them for their wish? Right. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, the short answer is I don't know because <laughs> I've watched uh, W. No, I need to be careful. Uh, WWE, first of all, is, uh, is an amazing supporter. Just the organization is an amazing supporter of, uh, of Make-A-Wish. And um, they not only provide great experiences for our kids, uh, they also support us financially very, very uh, well. I don't know if they were one of the logos that we had on there. But, um, but anyway, uh, one of their primary, uh, probably the face of WWE right now is a guy named John Cena. And he's, he's been in some... Um, and some movies, and uh, he's just a great guy. And so we honored him uh, because he just granted his 300th wish. And it's, uh, and it's pretty amazing because, you know, we don't, I think we have one other person who's granted 200 wishes, and I, I wanna say it's Jeff Gordon, the uh, NASCAR driver. But, um, but I, you know, it's, it's something that WWE fans are really passionate about that sport. And, um, and they know that these are um, guys that are fighting against evil forces and these kids are in the fight of their lives. And I really think some of it is that, that they resonate with, um, with that, that, uh, that sport or entertainment or whatever you wanna call it. The good news is, is that they're amazing to work with. And, uh, and so it was really a privilege to, uh, uh, to honor John. Uh, I've met him several times. He's one of those uh, celebrities that I mean, he is as good as gold. I mean, he, he's very humble, very, uh, very privileged. And to hear him talk about Make-A-Wish is, is terrific because you would think that most celebrities would say, all right, so here's a kid who's fighting for their life and they could wish for anything. They could wish to go anywhere, do anything, be anything. And they've only got one and they've got one wish and that wish is to spend time with me. Now, you would think that most people would say, wow, don't you, don't you want to wish for something more than that? Or, uh, or just be humbled by it. And I would say that most are. There are a few out there that aren't, but John is one of them. He is he's just genuine. He's a great guy. He spends more time with them than, um, than, than the expectation, uh, the expected time. And so he's just a great guy. So it's fun to talk about John. But the short answer is I don't know. I don't know what it is. Okay. Hi, thank you for coming. Your talk was great. Um, I wasn't aware about your international reach with mm -hmm. Make-A-Wish, and I wanted to know what are some of the um, troubles you've faced while you've tried to, um, you know, stretch your reach outward. Right. So uh, with Habitat, probably the biggest challenge that we had was, I think one of the things that we do in this country is we really take for granted the, uh, the culture of philanthropy that we have, the culture of volunteerism. And I'm not saying it's an exclusive U.S. thing, because it's not, but, but it is pretty remarkable in this country that you know, we expect corporations to do that, and that we expect people to volunteer, and we, the amount of uh, money that's given, not just to kids in this country, but to support causes all over the world, you know, we just kind of say, well, yeah. That, well, that's not the case all over the world. And so one of the biggest challenges was in trying to create organizations in various countries that would be self-sustaining. And so what, is it, what does it mean to have a self-sustaining habitat of, and you name the country? Well, you need board members. Well, you've gotta have people that it's, you're not gonna get money to sit on this board, right? In fact, there might be a requirement that you give so much money to be on this board. Um, you need people that are going to volunteer, and they're going to volunteer because they want to help their neighbors, and that, it, and that it's, this is not just this rich U.S. organization that's just going to provide all this money, but we want to have something that's a, a self-sustaining organization. So that was probably, you know, the biggest challenge was, was organizationally. I think from a mission standpoint, it was just as powerful, you know, to, to live in a simple, decent house 
that, that desire is as powerful in any other place of the world as, as it is here, uh, probably even more so. And so clearly, from a programmatic standpoint, it was uh, kind of the same challenge. In some countries, you'd have uh, issues with uh, land tenure laws, you know, because Habitat's about home ownership. Uh, but it was really organizationally. How can we set up autonomous, sustainable organizations that would not have to rely on another country for funding? That was, that was the biggest thing. All right, I have a question. The microphone's coming behind you. First of all, I'd like to thank you for coming. And also, I'm very excited that you were with Habitat for Humanity because I did a stint uh, very soon after my husband died. I felt like I wanted to do something for somebody else. And I encourage anyone who is uh, single, no matter what your age, to do it. And I did it in Northwest Africa. Wow. And I mean, it was harsh. <laughs> Which country? Uh, it was in Northwest Kenya. I'm okay, sorry. Okay, good right up by the Somali border. It yep. was very interesting and it was very basic, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that will do your heart good, like working with the villagers. And so I wanted to really tell you that my experience good. was positive beyond Great. belief. The second thing is with Make-A-Wish, um, do you have a big core of grant writers or what is the condition of most requests for funding from corporations at this point? Is there any? Uh, well, the, the, we need more money than, than, uh, than we have. Um, <laughs> here in Arkansas, we should, uh, actually I should uh, connect you two to see if maybe there's some, maybe there's a way you could help us uh, here, in, here in Arkansas, because that would, be, that would be terrific. I would imagine we have some needs here that, that maybe you could be helpful with. Okay. And, and uh, you know, in terms of Africa, it, it was interesting because I, I spent some time there and I spent the night uh, one night and I thought I was really kind of roughing it because to your point, you know, I, I spent a night in a habitat home and it was cement slab, it was cinder block walls, it was a tin roof, there was no electricity, there was no running water, there, you know, and so that kind of felt a little rugged. But it was not until we went to where those folks moved from and it was a mud floor, and it was mud and hay or thatch uh, walls and a thatch roof, and that's when you began to realize what a difference just that has. And I've always maintained that I think we would have a very different country if, if all of us just had the opportunity to spend one week, one week in a village in, in another country. And I think we just have a much greater appreciation for what we simply take for granted every day. Yeah. Question right here. There it comes, John. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we've, we've had a lot of speakers come through here and recommend that we experience something that we might not be entirely qualified for. And we've had people sort of suggest baptism by fire as the best learning experience. And I'm wondering, one, I guess, what you may have did to to convince people to give you this experience that was outside of your expertise? And two, when you're there, how much credence should be given to the fake it till you make it strategy? <laughs> and, and how much should you admit to not necessarily knowing? Got it. Wow, that's, that's quite a question there. Uh, so I think, um, you know, I think the first part was, uh, I, I don't want to say they were desperate, but they were desperate. And so, <laughs> you know, I, I think there was, so I don't know if there was anything. I mean, I, I think one, in, in both cases, I'd been a volunteer in the organization. And so one of the things I've always maintained is that, you know, if an individual thinks highly enough of an organization that they're willing to volunteer their time, then that at least tells me one thing. It tells me this isn't just, you're not just applying for a job. You're, this isn't just another thing on your resume. You actually believe in the mission of the organization. So that, that kind of gets you somewhere because there's always a part of interviewing anybody is, you know, so how, how interested are you in this? And that's always the first question I ask any applicant of any kind of position. So why? Why make a wish? Why, why are we having this conversation? And and you know, 
that's, I want to hear whether there's a, where there's a passion for this work uh, or not, because I think that passion a lot of time determines whether you're going to go that extra mile, whether you're going to stay up that extra hour or two to get that thing done, whether you're going to just do what it takes to be able to, uh, to move the organization forward. And so I would say maybe that was the, maybe that was the extra part. The second, the, you know, fake it until, is that what it was, fake it until you make it? Is that right? Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't, I, I would not recommend that because I think one of the biggest weaknesses that people have is that they, that they, they fail to admit when they don't know something or when they've made a mistake. And I think one of the most powerful things you can do, whether you're a leader or anywhere else, is to say, you know what, I don't know. What do you think? Or to say, look, I, I screwed up. I just, I made a big mistake. And, and I want to be the one to tell you. And I want you to hear it from me. And I want you to hear it now, as opposed to hearing about it, you know, two weeks from now. I, you know, I just think, I mean, we all make mistakes. And, uh, but what people aren't as forgiving about is, when you try to deny that you made a mistake or you try to put it off on somebody else or circumstances or you know all that kind of stuff because then there's a certain lack of accountability and we all have to be accountable for our actions. And so, so I would not recommend going down that route. Uh, nobody knows everything and nobody expects you to know everything. Um, I have, you know, just yesterday, oh, I, you know, I had one of our uh, members of our senior leadership team come into my office, you know, big mistake got made and he was just really, he was upset about it because it's, you know, this has been, we've had a couple mistakes on this, by this team and, um, you know, he was upset. I wasn't happy about it, but I appreciated the fact that he said, look, I want you to hear this from me. This is my department, so I take responsibility for it. Uh, we'll solve it and I'm really sorry it happened and we're going to try to figure out how to, how to make sure this doesn't happen again. All right, well, what are you gonna say to that? You gotta say, okay, well, let's, let's get at it. Whereas, if he's spending all his time talking about how it was really somebody, some other department's mistake, that, to me, just doesn't go anywhere. So I would say, admit your mistakes sooner, clearer, take responsibility for your actions. Yeah. And, and there's nothing wrong with saying, I don't know. I say it at least five times a day, so. A question right here. Hi, my name is James. I work here at the school with students to assist them before they go for their international field projects. Um, and you may or may not be aware, but a number of the people in this room intend to do their project with Habitat in I, a number of yes, places around the world. Um, could you, drawing on your experience with Habitat and with um, Make-A-Wish as well, could you give some advice to them for the people that this will be their first foray into working in a large bureaucratic environment? How do you manage dealing with the professionalism in a bureaucracy while also pushing for the things that you're passionate about. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, you know, that, I think that is one of the hardest um, uh, parts of, of starting off in your career is, be, is exactly being able to do that. And it's, uh, and it's very much walking a tightrope because you can't, you know, you can't go into any organization and just like gangbusters, I'm here, I'm here to save the world. And you know, here we go. I mean, you're just not going to get taken seriously. And at the same time, you don't want to be, um, you know, just kind of meld into the to the bureaucracy or or be paralyzed by it. And so, you know, to me, uh, it, it's not that dissimilar to when we have people come in to make a wish. Uh, one of the first things I do is is sit down with each person and and, and kind of welcome them to the organization. But um, but I also give a couple bits of advice. And so the first one is, is that, you know, you have to be able to collaborate well in any organization, but this is one you really do. This is a very much a relational organization. So during this orientation process, while you are the new person, you've got a great opportunity to be able to say, hey, I'm Dave, I'm new here. You know, I work in this department. Who, who are you and what do you do? You get to do that for a certain period of time after a certain period of time, you can't say you're the new person anymore. And so I think there's something about relationships, about getting to know as many different people. The more complex the bureaucracy, the more important relationships are, ultimately. And so I think it's, um, so I think it's that. I think it's, um, uh, it's one of those, um, 
Oh boy, I'm sorry. I just lost. I just lost my train of thought. Um, oh well, I'll have to come back to it. Sorry, but I, I, I think it's uh, I think it's relationships, and um, yeah, boy, I just lost it. Sorry. I, I will come back to it. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, collaboration. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks. My goodness, I'm starting to sweat up here. Um, <laughs> And I, and I better hurry up and say it before I forget it again. So the other one is that, you know, anytime you're in a new environment, you always notice things uh, kind of acutely when you're, when you're there, as opposed to, you know, you, if, if this is the hundredth time you've come into this building, you know, it all just kind of blends in. And so while when you start in an organization, you're getting all this stuff kind of thrown at you. You're just trying to, you're just trying to get your lay of the land. But what I think is really important is to, is to note the things that, boy, it seems like this would it'd be a better way to do this or do that. And, and maybe that's not the time that you're going to bring it up to your supervisor or to a division manager or if you ever get an opportunity to meet with them. But, but take note of it. Take note of all the things that kind of hit you early on because that's when you're most aware and 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 cognizant of everything that's going on around you. Because after a while, everybody gets settled in. You, you know, you just do. You get settled in and everything just kinda, kinda starts going along and, it's, and to me it's a lot harder. And so, so there's a difference between noticing that a change needs to be made and then taking the right time to be able to put that forward. And I guess that would be the last thing, is that you know, a lot of times we get an idea in our head and we wanna immediately you know, tell somebody, well, you know what, take your time on that jot it down someplace because timing is as important as the idea itself and a lot of times people mix that up as soon as they think something needs to be changed they're just going to you know burst right in and say hey we need to we need to do something and the timing just might not be right so that would be my advice let me uh, let me